start with um, on the in the book of Jonah with um, the view of Jonah, and um, the reason for that is because uh, there are many things that are going to come up in this story that are going to make you question certain things or whatever, and um, so I wanted to just start with finding out God's view of Jonah as we go. Um, but, but before we do that, I just want to give you a couple of, without you looking them up, I want to give you a couple of uh, verses in the book of Jonah that talk about him so that, you know, we could gain some perspective. <clears throat> Uh, this is right out of the first chapter, first couple of verses. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And then here's that part which most people know. But Jonah rose up all right. <laughs> He rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Okay, and this next portion comes from chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Okay? So, therefore now, this is uh, Jonah speaking. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. <clears throat> All right, so in this one, um, uh, he's basically starting the fourth chapter with being... Uh, whatever God did, it displeased him exceedingly. Okay? It displeased him exceedingly. And then the second part is, um, he says, therefore I beseech thee, uh, take my life from, from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Now, if you understand anything about life and death and you understand certain angles, there could be a situation, particularly in the New Testament, that is, but I mean even in the Old Testament, it's better than you die than to live, right? It's better to, for example, um, uh, Samson. Samson when they had him strapped up between the two pillars and, and, uh, and he said, Lord, you know, this one time now, let me glorify you, you know what I mean? Let him go into death. And, that, and the scripture says that in his death, he killed more Philistines, meaning he did more damage to the enemy than he did in all of his life before that, which was, by the way, quite a few. Um, but that's not the case here. That's not the case here because um, let me read it to you so that you can see it. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? So he was speaking in anger, not in faith. You see that? Okay. And then, so he's, he's done preaching, 
and there's going to be this great revival and he leaves the city he goes and gets up on this hill or mountain overlooking the city and he sits down and he just well, I'm going to see what's going to happen I'm going to see what God's going to do okay so um, what is our opinion of Jonah what is our opinion of Jonah um, so I want to I want to talk about flawed Bible characters okay I can I can talk about flawed New Testament characters within this room <laughs> I was talking to someone today and, when, and the person said to me we are uh, you know, we have blind spots. And I said, I know, I do. And my mind, you gotta understand my mind. So my mind runs with that, starts going and says, says uh, if it's a blind spot, you don't know that you have blind spots. <laughs> or it wouldn't be a blind spot. Come on, help me out here. I have blind spots, but you don't know. Well, we do have, we all do. And I think we've made enough mistakes in our life to know, in our Christian life, to know that we do. But, um, so let me just read some of this on um, uh, what is your view of Jonah. Okay. Many times when we read stories in the Bible, we take things at face value uh, without getting the Lord's mind concerning his view of things. This is particularly true of biblical characters with whom it seems obvious that they are flawed. We make judgments about them based on the blatant shortcomings that they exhibit. One such man is the prophet Jonah. Who do you think of that first when that comes up? First person that you think of that is flawed and you probably thought, well, I don't know about this guy. Anybody? Nobody thinks of Peter? Peter. My God. Well, then speak up. Spit out your candy. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, Peter. Man, and that's a New Testament guy, but it's worse it's even worse with Peter because Peter is chosen by Jesus and he's walking with him for three and a half years. I mean, you talk about being flawed until God finishes with him and you read 1 Peter. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to tell a story and, and some of you know this and some of you don't, so it'll be easier just for me to read the story, um, although I told it to you sometime or another. Um, focusing on the flaws and missing the Lord. In my office in a former church building in which we gathered was a full wall mural. It was a gorgeous landscape that practically filled most of one wall in, in the room. The pastor of the former church that owned the building told me that the mural was a gift from a man who said it was free because it had a slight flaw in it. And it was, I mean, it was huge. It was way bigger than this thing. It, it filled the wall. You remember that one, don't you? Do you know which church I'm talking about? Bolivar. <laughs> and, and, um, and I'm coming in to, to take over the church in that office, and, and he tells me this story. And I'm sitting there looking at this mural while he's telling me this story, the, the former pastor who sold us the church. <clears throat> um, the pastor of the former church that owned the building told me that the mural was a gift from a man who said it was free because it had a slight flaw in it. After the benefactor glued the mural in place and left, that pastor said he spent most of that day and many days afterwards looking for the flaw. 
okay, this gorgeous thing, and it was, and he's gone. And, and the last words were, there's a flaw in it, but he didn't tell him where it was. So, um, spent the most of that day and many days afterwards looking for that flaw. One day, after many weeks went by, he happened to look up and catch a glimpse of the magnitude of the beauty of the full scene that the mural portrayed. Afterwards, he thought about how long it took him to see the greater beauty of the big picture uh, of the mural because he had spent so much time looking for one little flaw. As Christians, we're guilty of the same thing. As with Jonah, we read the Old Testament account and only catch the flaws. Because of that, we think less of Jonah. We not only do this with Bible characters, but with, with fellow Christians. Our focus is earthbound and circumstance oriented. But Jesus has a higher view of things based upon union and based on what the cross has accomplished. We miss beholding the cross because we focus on some person and his failures instead of on what Christ did on the cross. Like Pharisees, we see Jonah as being wrong, but God sees us as the ones who are wrong. Okay? So, um, there, every human being is flawed. Okay? <laughs> every human being is flawed. We all have stuff. <clears throat> um, one of the things that humans do, though, is with every human being being flawed, what we do is we try to hide our flaws and present to everybody, you know, the good parts, which the good parts may be part of being flawed, too. They, they could, could well. But they make us look good, whereas the flaws don't. But the hidden flaws could be flaws nonetheless, but they make us look better. So we'll, we'll promote that to the general public. Um, uh, so there is, there is this reality. I mean, you know, you're going to deal with that as Christians, and you're going to deal with that as leaders, and you're going to deal with that as a pastor, if that be the case. You're going to deal with that in all of constantly. I mean, it's just constant. You know, I, um, I remember talking to a, a young pastor a long time ago, and, uh, and they were really going through it and having problems, and we sat down together and talked about it, and he said, you know, I thought, I thought that being a pastor was going to be just an incredible thing. He said, but I'm just dealing with problems all the time. I'm just dealing with people's issues. I'm just dealing with people disagreeing with that and not wanting this. And it's one side says it's too hot in here, and the other side says it's too cold. And you know, and just incredibly discouraged with you know all that was going on. Well, that's why. Um, the scriptures say don't be a novice, don't put, to put a new Christian in there. And uh, that's even more important than you think because probably won't be this Thursday in the uh, pro self class, but somewhere along the line we get into that. <clears throat> uh, and it's so blatant, it's so blatant, but it's not blatant when you have dreams and aspirations and, and we think they're holy dreams because they're for the Lord. We think that the, that makes them holy, but they're not holy until we're holy, if you will. You know what I mean? Until there's a work done. There needs to be a work done in all of us anyway. But particularly if, you know, you're, you know, I remember one time that the new creation got so bad with people griping and stuff that I think I made this publicly, this statement public one time, and y'all tell me if y'all remember me doing it, because maybe I'm exposing myself. But I said, you know, I'm pastoring a flock of wolves. You remember me saying, so I said it publicly. <laughs> you know, I'm pastoring a flock of wolves. Well, how discouraging can that be if your desire is 
to bring people along in the Lord, but they're biting and devouring one another, which Paul talks about. Well, I'm sorry, but that's, that's part of being in the ministry. That's part of serving the Lord. That's part of being a son of God by Christ. That's part of, of being uh, united with Christ crucified. So, the, so we need to, well, let me just say this, this and then I'll move on with, with what I was reading. We, uh, we're so busy looking at the circumstances and then trying to think of how to fix it. And the longer you do that and not see any fruit, the worst that you're going to feel. I mean, it can really get to you. But just a little advice from me, and that is the one thing, not, not the one thing, I'm sorry, one thing that really keeps me afloat when dealing with people's lives and, and many times at their worst is they're usually born again, and if they're born again, they have Christ in them, and Christ in you is the hope of glory, and Christ in them is the hope of glory, not them. Amen? That's the hope. That's not just our hope. That's God's hope. So God's hoping, too, <laughs> you know, that we'll let Christ in us increase and we'll decrease. But but, um, you know, many of us have stubborn lines uh, that run within us, and we have all, not just that. That's just one example. So many things that do that, <clears throat> um, that it can, it can be discouraging if you don't have something other than the person to hang on to for the person. And if you do have Christ in them, no matter how bad they are, and every time they get with you, you're still encouraged. That encourages them toward Christ in them. You see that? But if every time they meet, it's like, there's no hope for you, or, you know, you're the worst, or, you know, you're just like, you know, ay caramba. Even, even the Spanish people would laugh at that one. Um, then, you know, you're so in negativity and discouragement. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see, where did I leave it? <clears throat> okay, so another problem is not just seeing the flaws, but when we go, for example, to the book of Jonah, or any book, really, but we go there uh, looking for answers for our life. And I know that's so common. I know that's such a big deal. I know that people want Jesus. I know they want to be better. I know that they want to honor him. I know, I know that. But the Bible is not there to give us answers for our life. It's there to have his life formed in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And him, his, his nature, his uh, looking into his face and being changed into that same image from glory to glory. <clears throat> so believe it or not, we can, and I, I'm not finished with that, but, but believe it or not, we can look at Jonah or Peter or anybody and say, well, there's still hope. Hope does not mean that's a guarantee because they have to turn their eyes off of themselves onto that hope. It's not guaranteed. So you can have, right, you know, for years and years and years and years and years, you can have hope and years and years and years and years. And years. <laughs> you can have hope for somebody and then it, it ends up, turns out that they never really got there, you know. Well, you can't guarantee, you can't guarantee that, but Jesus is guaranteed 
Do you see the difference? Jesus has still guaranteed that if you, if you do that, if you'll, if you'll get your eyes off of you. So, um, but there are other ways in which we misinterpret the book of Jonah. We may use him as a lesson to us how not to be. Okay. Okay. Think about what I just said. Jonah, I just read the book of Jonah, and that is a lesson to me of how not to be. You know, if Christ isn't formed in you, you'll probably end up being like Jonah. I mean, that's, your, that's what you're shooting for. <clears throat> um, we may use him, um, well, for many who read the book of Jonah, <clears throat> they assume that it's, it is primarily a story about the waywardness of one of God's prophets. Okay, so... Oh, you know, praise God for Jeremiah. Oh, Isaiah, sweet Isaiah. But Jonah the prophet, because Jonah, the book of Jonah is in the books of the prophets. And Jesus called him a prophet. Um, <clears throat> the waywardness of one of God's prophets but that's not what the book of Jonah is about. It has nothing to do with that. I mean, it doesn't. That's not, there's nowhere in there that that's the lesson. There are lessons that'll bring you to not be wayward, <laughs> but just seeing his waywardness and going, well, I'm not gonna do that. That's a good way to get in trouble. <laughs> the Lord's saying, yes, you will. Da -da 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 -da. What am I doing? <laughs> no, no, it's Satan. Anyway, <clears throat> on the other hand, Nineveh's sinfulness and Jonah's rebellion could have just been a story addressing our need for salvation or for obedience. Okay, so go to Nineveh, you know, and he rises up and he goes not to Nineveh. Okay, so we go see. And brothers and sisters, the Lord wants you to be obedient to his word. Well, he does want you to be obedient to his word. But the main use of obedience in the New Testament tends to be along the lines of Jesus was obedient unto death. You know. So, and when it is obedience working in us, it is, again, not in our nature since the breach to be obedient try as we will you ever wanted to and didn't <laughs> okay i'm gonna go with the lord on this i just heard brother randy sharing that was really from the lord i'm gonna you know and you get outside the door and boom and by the way i learned that by trying to be obedient I did. I learned it by me saying, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to have obedience, I mean. And I'm going to, you know, I hear, I heard a message, and I said, yes, okay, I got this. And I could feel it and everything. And I went out and, I mean, didn't get three steps outside the church that I was wayward again. So... Um, if we do not see Christ revealed in the story, then we tend to approach the story in terms of seeking for godly theorems whereby we might improve our Christian walk. Yes, I use the word theorems. <laughs> Just so you know, that wasn't somebody's book because I know what people are doing when it comes to theorems. Whereby we might improve our Christian walk. All right. There is, um, I was in a, I'll just tell you a little story, a fairly recent story. I went into uh, a Goodwill recently, and there was, um, I noticed when I was getting out of my car that a guy got out of his across the parking lot, and he was going to go in, and he had, uh, he had, Longer brown hair, but it was kind of nicely kept, but it was, it was longer. And he had a big beard, and he was young. 
and he he had uh, he had on white overalls and a white shirt under that and all of that and um, so you know Mr. Curiosity here when I, he got into the store I went and found the row that he was in he walked up and said hey man what's going on and he said uh, Jesus and I said, uh, well, that's, that's the truth, you know. And uh, I said, so, so what's, the, what's with the outfit and everything? He said, well, the Bible says that we'll be clothed in white. I mean, they were overalls, okay. <laughs> white overalls, though. I mean, I couldn't argue with that. But, I mean, it was, you could immediately spot that there was something going on here, you know. And uh, so I said, uh, so um, what church are you with? And he said, well, what, what we teach is uh, that we be obedient to Christ in everything, and we don't make excuses. We, you know, just started going through, and it all sounded good and everything. And I said, but have you ever noticed that how Paul puts so much emphasis not on us living the Christian life, but on him doing that in us and that we are dead and he goes again right back to that same thing as if this was his theorem no well i mean he didn't say no he just said well and you know we're we're uh we're a group of people that um we love jesus so we want to please him and, of course, I would come back with another scripture about being dead with Christ, you know, and not our life. I said, and at a certain juncture after three or four of those, I said, you know, it seems to me like you're putting the emphasis on our life, but doesn't so-and-so scripture and that one and that one and that one, and I started just quoting them, doesn't that really emphasize the fact that it's his life? And he's going, you know, I could tell that, his shield was being, you know, coming down a little bit. But, um, but then finally he said, well, um, we're just trying to, uh, uh, how did he put that? We're just trying to um, glorify God and, and, uh, be what he wants us to be like in John 17. And I said, well, Jesus' prayer wasn't anything like that about us being, and I wasn't rude or mean. I mean, I was just, you know, and, and I, said, I said, Jesus is giving the Father a prayer request or, or making his prayer request up that we would be one as they were one before the foundation of the world. That's more than us who have been since the foundation of the world becoming good Christians. That's based on a oneness that was already here and that Jesus is praying that that's what will happen with us. And, uh, and I said, in fact, you know, we usually... We, we, we pray all of these prayers. I said, we pray all of these prayers. And Jesus answers our prayer request. But Jesus is praying that. And we could answer that prayer request by becoming one, by seeking to be one with them in oneness instead of individually being a good Christian. And he goes, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> he starts writing it. Yeah, that's good. And starts writing it down, and I figured that was enough, you know. And uh, I did. I did ask him if where his church was, and he gave me a little card. And, uh, and as of yet, I haven't felt the Lord to. It's the one beside my bed tucked. Uh, I haven't felt to call him yet, but you know, I. I enjoyed the conversation, and, and it ended well. It didn't end, you know. But, uh, and, and I wasn't trying to shoot, shoot him down and his beliefs. I was trying to lift up, do you understand, the, the reality that, that we're supposed to be dead and Christ is our life. Anyway, 
So seeking for answers for our life is where that little story came from, um, instead of, as it were, being willing to give up our life and therefore give up seeking for self-improvement, you know, humanism. Okay. All right. So. All right, and then um, so the Bible is about the Bible is about Christ and Christ being revealed in us. So I wrote, however, Bible stories are not just given so that we may find moral applications for our lives. You see how that keeps pointing back to us? And let me tell you, that's, a, that's a, like a hamster on one of those wheels. You'll never defeat your life as long as you're alive. It, it, Jesus defeated it by putting you to death and then giving you his life. But as long as we keep, you know, and we can hear that and believe that, and, you know, yes, I, I want that, but keep drifting because we'll drift and then we'll get in a situation and we'll look to our life or we'll find hope in our life. Well, I know how to deal with this because I'm, you know what I mean? I've, I, I've dealt, I've got uh, experience in this area. Well, okay, I'm not talking about learning how to paint a wall or something. <laughs> I'm talking about being what God wants according to the, the cross and according, according to what Jesus did there. Um, the whole Bible is a book that is designed to reveal Christ. Behind each story is hidden reality concerning the eternal Christ. Now, I do know that there are Christians that don't believe that. <clears throat> um, they, um, they believe that there's some stories, like maybe the book of Jonah, because in the New Testament Jesus talked about it, so maybe that's true there. But, but Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. In them you think you have life that's going to keep on going. But, you know, they are they which testify of me. And um, I haven't, in every portion of the Old Testament and New Testament, seen that to be true, but I've seen it in my years to be true an amazing amount of times. That stories that I thought were simply a historical story ends up being an incredible revelation of Christ when the Spirit takes a veil off. In the meantime, though, the rest of the book to this day is closed to me until the Spirit of God takes the veil off. Uh, there are... Um, Behind each story is a hidden reality concerning the eternal Christ. There are actually two main accounts concerning Jonah in the Bible. So this is, this is important. Number one, the historical record in the Old Testament books, or particularly the Old Testament book of Jonah. And then number two, Jesus' spiritual interpretation in the New Testament. Clearly, the reigning view of Jonah should be based on Jesus' perception of the man and how he should be comprehended by New Testament believers. All right, so we want to get into a little bit. I, I, I don't think as yet tonight that I literally get into the quotes where he talks about being a greater than Jonah and, you know, that sort of thing, because I'm trying to just build um, an understanding that whatever view we come from in relationship to Jonah, whether it's the flawed one or the this or the that or the theorems or whatever, none of that would matter anyway, because Jesus has given us his picture or his view of Jonah. All right. So, 
Uh, I wrote, I'm not ready to fully address this, but <clears throat> it is interesting that Jesus chose to speak of Jonah in a positive light. Right? Y'all, y'all, surely you all have read it. Okay. In a positive light. He did this in spite of how negative Jonah may have appeared in the Old Testament book. So that's a, that's a pretty amazing thought when you think about it. The Old Testament book of Jonah can give you a really bad feel about Jonah. Whereas Jesus, when he talks about him, which is the only one that matters, when he talks about him, it's a completely different feel. All right? So that's, you know. Um, so, so let it be noted that Jesus did refer to Jonah in a positive way and not as one who should be looked upon with suspicion or rejection. Also, other references of Jonah in the Old Testament outside of the book of Jonah speak of him with dignity and honor as one who is a true servant of God. All right. Anybody found at least one of those scriptures where it spoke of, um, spoke highly of Jonah? Well, try 2 Kings 14, 25. All right. And that says, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain. And here it comes. According to the word of the Lord God of, the Lord God of Israel, which he spake, meaning the Lord God of Israel spake, by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of geth Hefer. Whoa, this man's already, he's, he, he's a prophet, and he's already uh, moving with the Lord. There's already stuff that is there that declares his status um, to the Lord. That's 2 Kings 14, 25. And I'll, I'll um, highlight those in just a minute, but let me finish one more paragraph here. Without a doubt, Jonah was respected long after his death, and the things that he spoke were clearly from God. He restored the coast, but did so in accord with the word of the Lord God. Also, when he spoke, it was God speaking. Yes, he was a prophet of God, but higher than that, he was God's servant. Because all those things are mentioned there. Okay? Wow. Okay. Um... So let's summarize some of the things I just talked about. Um, uh, he was a prophet. No, he was according to his prophet, the Lord God's prophet. He was God's prophet. Okay. He's also a sign. Okay. Um, Nineveh repented of his preaching. Israel didn't at Jesus's. Okay, so they, I mean, he literally brought in a hundred year revival in uh, Nineveh. Okay, then, uh, uh, so he was, uh, Jesus is greater than Jonah, uh, but he was a servant of God which, by the way, I mean, that's, you know, I don't know how many times you may, you know, just skip over reading so-and-so, uh, uh, Paul, the servant of da-da-da-da, or Peter, a servant of da-da-da-da. But I'm telling you, that also has real importance on several different lines of thought, but one line of thought is the breach. They are identified as, well, I serve him, the living God. It's big stuff to God, all right? Um, uh, he's not just a greater, uh, okay, and he spoke God's word. So instead of placing Jonah as some rebellious person who runs from God, Jesus puts him in the same category as himself. Our Lord does not reject Jonah, but sides with him. No, identifies with him as one who went through death, burial, and resurrection. 
Oh, to be like Jonah <laughs> in light of Jesus' view. Okay? So I wrote, uh, consider this. In Luke 24, 25 through 27, Jesus speaks of his own sufferings. You know, this is the road to Emmaus. So Jesus is talking to the guys after, you know, after he has died and risen, but they don't recognize him yet. Uh, Jesus speaks of his own sufferings to be had on the cross, and he did so from, meaning Jesus shared with the guys on the road to Emmaus from the scripture. He did so beginning at Moses and all the prophets, all the prophets, all, A-L-L, -L, the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Well, Jonah was one of the prophets. The book of Jonah was already in the prophets and he was already understood to be a prophet and Jonah, I can, I can see them walking along and Jesus is sharing and he's opening this scripture, opening that and over here, you know, and he's opening stuff from, from uh, Moses as we know the, the Pentateuch and all that. Uh, and then he goes, and, and look here in Jonah. Da, 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 da. Look, this is an explanation of my death, burial, and resurrection. And they're going, didn't our hearts burn within us? Because it says from all the prophets. However, there are many aspects of the cross to be found. Okay, so um, it's like a diamond that has many facets setting forth varied colors. The picture of the cross that Jonah depicts is not just Jesus' death for sins. but that of bearing the reproach of the cross as described in Hebrews 13, 13. Let us go forth therefore unto him without or outside the camp bearing his reproach. It is a story of our struggle with willingness to be conformed to Christ with his shame and humiliation. Okay. So, With this in mind, uh, let's consider Jesus' word. So we're going to look at, at um, what Jesus said of Jonah. We're going to look at him uh, from Matthew's point of view. Okay? This is Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 41. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the uh, whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. So well, there you have it. You have it from the mouth of Jesus and who are we to judge? It's also an interesting thing that as I was meditating on it, that the Holy Spirit reminded me that uh, Peter was called Peter, son of Jonas. <laughs> and I thought, on both sides of the spectrum. <laughs> I mean, he, he's like Peter who was flawed and failed and all this other stuff, but then he was also like Peter who went through the sufferings and, you know, all right, so, all right, let me try to get through this last little part. Um, I, I'm sorry that I'm doing so much reading, but I have to tell you that I spend so much time trying to reorganize my notes for you to make it better, and sometimes it's just dizzying to me, and so it's like, if I can get something concrete down, then I can 
because you know if I didn't have very many notes it'd be simple <laughs> but it's like oh my lord all right so this is God is the master and judge this is the wrap up of what we've been talking about <clears throat> every Christian knows and believes that God alone is the great judge and yet and yet the first time they are confronted with injustices by others toward themselves, they immediately become judge, jury, and executioner. Anybody ever experienced that before? Anybody experienced it beyond before? Meaning <laughs> it's sort of been a, a trail of blood behind you. <laughs> um, they take things into their own hands. This is in direct violation of the scriptures and the basic Christian uh, belief system, yet all is thrown out the window immediately when it becomes personal. Consider this verse in Romans 14, 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. There's your Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's the hope. See, I mean, he's saying, he's literally saying, you're judging another man's servant, and, um, um, and to his own master he stands or falls, meaning he could be in either situation. He could be really standing and you're just accusing him, or he can be falling, failing, you know, flawed, and yet he's still God's servant. So he says... Um, Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. All right? Well, God is able. He didn't say the flawed one that you're judging uh, is going to make the course corrections. It says God is able. And don't judge. That's what it's saying. Well, you know, we, folks... When we judge, it's a, it's a high form of pro-self. I'm sorry, it's self-righteousness. It is. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the first things he said, judge not that you be not judged. So, and, and I think Jesus went on to say, uh, judge not that you be not judged. Um, well, of course, for with judgment you judge, you shall be judged again. But in, if it's not in there, it's another place. It says, for he that judgeth, judgeth the law, or is judging according to the law, which the law says, this is, this is right, thou shalt, and this is wrong, thou shalt not. That means this is the tree of life, and this is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But he's referring it to the law, and he's saying that you're not, you're not flowing when you do that. You're not flowing with the mindset of the master. You're literally, as it were, let me just say it like this so that maybe it can make a little more sense. You're literally going into the master's house, pointing out one of his servants and thinking thoughts or communicating thoughts to others or talking to God about them when, you know, the Lord's able to make him stand. So what if he makes him stand and then, you know, he has to, you know, by God's hand, he's made to stand, but now he has to bear the reproach that you put upon him because you judged him and then you couldn't keep your mouth shut. I'm such an eloquent speaker. So eloquent. Couldn't keep his mouth shut. No. Just a Texas boy trying to get this truth across to us. Um, compare that verse with Jonah 4, 4 uh, through 11, in which it is unmistakable that God was dealing with Jonah on a personal level, but how he was dealing with the prophet was God's business, not ours. So here's the problem. We, we don't think that the master that it's talking about here, his, his master, the one we're accusing, the one we're judging, we don't think that the master he has is God. We think it's Satan. 
but this is referring to um, that it's God. And you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You shouldn't be judging. You shouldn't be judging. Just leave it with the Lord. See, now, if you don't, again, then it's a superior thing. I'm better than them, and they need to shape up. But if you leave it with the Lord, there's no pro-self going on in that. You know what I mean? You're trusting the Lord. And this says to trust the Lord, for he is able to make him stand. Anyway, I know that's a hard thing, and I know that we will hear that, and we will go, well, that's, that's good information, uh, and turn right around and say, this could be another one of those things. You walk out the door and see something and go, did you see that? And go up to God and say, did you see that? And he's going, did you hear what I was trying to say to you in class? What? <laughs> what, was you, what were you trying to say? All right, so God tells us, um, God does not tell us to stick, out, stick our nose into his present work in other people's lives, but to know no man after the flesh. Okay, now that's, is that powerful if you really think about it? To know no man after the flesh. Well, we pretty much know everybody, including our brother, Christian brothers and sisters after the flesh. But we don't have to. We can know him after Christ. We can know him after the cross. We can know him after God's view. And then God will have to deal. God will deal with whatever the issue is, whether sheep or goat. <clears throat> God is fully aware of the lack in people's lives, and we probably are also. But he tells us to not focus there. If we follow Jesus and bow in honor to his right to be king, then we accept his interpretation of the Jonas of this world and do not base our views on people, uh, views of people on Old Testament realities, but on the Son of God realities. That's Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. Jonah would one day be honored by his people as a great servant of God, but at this point in his walk, there were things that needed to be worked on. God may work to form more of Christ in us, but his eternal view of us is that we are in union with Christ. The issue of our flaws at this present time will one day no longer be issues. Okay, and I mean, if you think about it, well, I don't even want to bring that in. So Jesus' view of Jonah is a very sound warning to all believers to learn to see things through the cross and by means of revelation and not to judge according to the flesh. Amen? Anybody want to close with a word of prayer? If you do, come up here. Yeah, come on. And thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this class, and I pray that, uh, that we would actually develop hearts like Jonah, um, that, that uh, we wouldn't look to glorify ourselves as something great, but, um, but our ra every, everything in our life would be saying, not I, but Christ. And then, if, then what Jesus wants, it, God, he'll li he will lift up Christ in us. But that may be, we'll, we'll never see the fruit of that. Jonah never saw in his lifetime the, Jesus' words about him. Yes, but, but his life, he lived it to impact you. He lived it to glorify God. And that was more valuable to him than fame or, 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 no, or, um, or earthly glory. So, Father, help us to, to live that way. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you for being willing to jump up and pray. I so appreciate it. And uh, it's always good in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you know, if, if this has more power.